Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Jime said, my name is Paulina Bravo and I'm the academic consultant for Richmond Publishing here in Chile. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this Flip It Over um, webinar. Like Jime said, again, this is the same session that we did uh, last Thursday. So if you attended last uh, Thursday, maybe it's not necessary for you to stay. Um, so you can leave the room for uh, other teachers to participate too. If you didn't attend last week, well, you're welcome to join us today. Um, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna hide myself here, hide my face, and then we'll start. Um, I always like to begin my uh, sessions or my workshops with an activity that teachers can do in pairs or in groups or with the hands-on activity. Um, unfortunately, as we are so far away and we are miles away, uh, we cannot do that. Uh, that's why I selected to start with this joke instead. So if you take a look at this joke and this picture here, you will see that uh, there is a teacher that is uh, literally um, upside down, right? And I'm sure that most of us at least once have felt the same way, right? Like we are literally upside down in our classrooms uh, with our students. So um, that, this is just like to, to get into the mood, get into, you know, into the zone of what we're going to be discussing in this uh, session. Um, and although technology is doing a lot for us in these times, uh, I still like to know who my audience is. So we are going to begin with a quick uh, poll. You will see on your screens three questions with uh, three alternatives each. You uh, will have to read this, the questions and select the choice that you relate to the most, okay? There's no right or wrong answers. It's just to select the alternatives you relate to the most. So uh, let me start with this one. Uh, Hime, you please let me know if you can see it. You um, can see it, yeah. You can see it, fantastic. Uh -huh. Okay. So here we have the questions. How familiar is the flipped classroom methodology for you? You have to select the alternative you relate to the most. That is number one. Uh, Yes, very familiar. I know something, but it's always good to keep knowledge up to date. Yeah, I am not very familiar with this approach. Number two, if you can see number three, you have to scroll down to see and to be able to read all the alternatives. Number two, how willing are you to innovate? Very willing to do so. A little. Changes can be scary sometimes. Or I prefer working with traditional methods and approaches. And number three, how do you feel today? I am happy and motivated, a bit tired, or the pandemic is driving me crazy. Be honest, be honest, and select the alternative you relate to uh, the most. We will have uh, one more minute, so everyone uh, can have the chance to answer this poll, and then we will see, and I will share the results with you. I see that everyone is, everyone is voting. Mm -hmm. 95 out of 168 participants. Yes, almost 100, good. Yes, everyone is voting. I can see that you're voting, thank you. We will have a couple of more seconds. Mm -hmm. We are close to 70% of voters. Okay. Okay. Let's see, uh, and let me share with you the, uh, the results, okay? We're going to stop this and share the results. Let's see. 
So um, for question number one, we have 54% of uh, participants say that you know something, but it's always good to keep knowledge up to date. Of course, we always uh, like to be up to date with everything that has to do with teaching and learning, right? Good, thank you for that. Number two, how willing are you to innovate? 78%, of course, you're very willing to innovate. Fantastic, yes, a good answer. And number three, how do you feel today? Most of you also feel happy and motivated. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to see and to read. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to stop this now, stopping the results with you. And uh, later on, we will have a second poll, okay? Good. Then uh, let's move on. So if we have to think of um, the main uh, goals that I have for the sessions, this session with you today are basically these three. The idea is that we can learn a little bit about the flipped classroom model and its basis, that we can compare this model with the traditional model also, and finally, and I think most importantly, to highlight some tools for, the, uh, for flipped classroom practices. Mm -hmm. So if we have to answer, like in very general terms, if we have to answer the question, what is the flipped classroom approach or what is the flipped classroom method, we would have to say that it is this in very simple words. It is a pedagogical model that is based on inverting the traditional structure of classroom instruction through the use of the information and communication technologies. Okay, as simple as that. It's basically the essence. The essence of the flipped classroom approach or method is this, okay? It is inverting the traditional classroom instruction using these tools and resources that are called information and communication technologies. So basically what happens today in the traditional classroom model is that the teacher prepares and delivers instruction on different topics or concepts or subject areas to the whole class. What happens with the students is that, is that students listen in a more passive way. Um, they listen, they sit in class and take notes, especially if we're thinking about adults or young adults, right? They are used to taking notes in class. Um, students complete tasks to develop their understanding. They sometimes just I mean, they listen to the teacher, to, they listen, they participate in class instruction, and they just complete tasks. Homework is assigned mainly to consolidate understanding. Here in the traditional uh, classroom instruction model, the teacher's role is basically to lead the lesson or just to pass on the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the learning activities are um, predominantly offline, uh, taken from uh, textbooks or worksheets that teachers prepare uh, beforehand uh, with their students. So th basically, this is what happens uh, so far or most of the time in the traditional classroom model. What happens in the flipped classroom uh, model is that the teacher prepares or selects the materials for students to access the instruction on different concepts on, or topics or subject areas, but outside the class, okay? What students do instead of sitting uh, in a passive way in the classroom, students watch online or digital videos also outside the, less, outside the classroom, sorry. Students do some exercises and some tasks as part of the homework in order to prepare themselves before the lessons. The class time is uh, especially devoted to active learning. So here students participate in groups uh, or in pairs, they um, do extension activities, and also the teacher has the opportunity to support students' individual needs as well like their teachers receive support, for, a student, sorry, receive support from the teacher. So the teacher's role is basically to be a facilitator. So teachers here facilitate learning uh, and monitor students' activities and tasks uh, in the classroom, in class time. Mm -hmm. So if we have to uh, like put this 
uh, like in a summary, in a picture, this is what we would have, right? The flipped classroom model, we have what happens in class time, like during the class, and we also have what happens outside the class, before and after. So if you see there, uh, the purple uh, square there, we have that students prepare to participate in class activities, watching videos, or reading uh, specific um, uh, textbooks or audiobooks selected by the teacher before the class, right, and outside the classroom. Uh, and what they do, student, what is uh, expected from students to do in the class is that they can actively participate and practice applying the key concepts uh, that they pre previously reviewed or what they previously read. And then what they can do after class and also outside the class again is that they can expand what they did. The students continue checking their understanding and they can extend their learning by doing other tasks or other activities. Uh, they can also work together like in, in an interactive way but also outside the class. They can uh, you know participate with their classmates, with their, their peers. So this is like a summary uh, put there in a picture. But uh, I have to be fair and I have to say that oh I mean this is this approach is re not really that new, uh, but it seems that with uh, everything that is happening today, uh, with everything that we are facing as a society and also as teachers, uh, it seems that it has raised again, or more people are uh, uh, more interested in getting to know a little bit of more, a little bit about um, the classroom or how to approach it or how to work with it. So we would have to go back in time a little bit and just uh to see where and when everything is started okay so first of all in 1998 um by that time this approach had already been uh used for a couple of years uh especially in the disciplines related to the humanities so barbara walford and virginia johnson anderson um, both of them propose a model in which students gain first exposure learning prior to the class. They were among the first who started to talk about this uh, so that students could focus on the processing part of learning, like synthesizing, analyzing, uh, solving problems, etc. Right? So they could do that in class. Um, so, in order to ensure that students have the, the preparation, that is necessary for a productive class time, they design this uh, assignment-based model in which students actually produce work, right? Like writing tasks or solving problems, like I said before, and they do that prior to class. So what happens is that students then in class receive the productive feedback throughout these activities that are like traditional activities that students do in class. Okay, so that is basically what happened back there in 1998. In 2000, then we have late platinum triglia, sorry. They described a very similar approach and they call it the inverted classroom. They, they also were among the first ones to start like putting a name to this approach. They call it the inverted classroom. And what they did, was basically because they were teaching at the university in um, an economics uh, course, Introduction to Economics. So what they did or what they started doing was some kind of a, an experiment basically, because they observed uh, that the traditional lecture format um, was incompatible with their students' learning styles, okay? So they wanted to make it more compatible and in order to do so, um, they designed this inverted classroom, you know, model in which they provided students with a variety of different tools so students could gain this first exposure um, to the learning, but with different materials outside the classroom. For example, they started giving their students like textbooks, reading, lecture videos, PowerPoint presentations, uh, printable slides or worksheets and etc. That happened in 2000. A year later, in 2001, yes, um, Eric Mazur and Catherine Croach described a slightly modified 
form of the flipped flip classroom model, and they call it peer instruction. So like uh, what the previous authors uh, also did, um, Masur and Crouch uh, dis described, or they came up with this peer instruction model that required that students gain first exposure, again, prior to class, but use different assignments, like quizzes, for example, in class, right? So they could come to cl class, class prepare and do that and answer these quizzes in class. So what they did is that class, here basically class time was structured around these um, mini lectures and answering like conceptual questions or like uh, big questions. Uh, and the idea of those, or uh, of answering those conceptual questions was that, I mean, all, first of all, all the students were required. They had to answer all the questions, but they had to do it, had to do it in groups or in pairs. So what happens is that students become also like instructors and they start correcting each other and they provide feedback to uh, their classmates. So if what happens if that students did, uh, did not uh, get to the correct answers and teacher could identify that, they have to go back to the question again, correct each other, provide feedback and come up with a new alternative or try to uh, answer the question correctly. Mm -hmm. that, that's why it is called peer instruction. And in 2012, uh, Berman and Sams, um, actually they were also, uh, as the authors uh, already mentioned, they were actually the first one to flip their classrooms. They found out that, they, because they were chemistry teachers, so they found out uh, that their students really wanted them to answer the questions and help them when they didn't understand uh, the course concepts or the subject area or some topics. Because they identified that students did not require the same level of support when they were doing activities, when they were teaching, when they were in, in the instruction period of the lesson. Um, so what they did is that they uh, shift, you know, they moved th this in-class delivery or in-class instruction that is often very teacher-centered. Uh, so they moved to, um, to, more, to having more discussion with the students, more analysis with their students. So both teacher and students, you know, assume more responsibility with this uh with this uh, model or with this uh, kind of flip uh, classroom and it's also interesting that um because they did a study and their study described that students move at their own pace right uh so teachers have also more time for this one-to-one -one interaction this one-to-one -one work with the students who need actually uh, more support uh, think of maybe sometimes the students who are athletes, for example, students who are absent um, most of the time uh, uh, in their classes, right? So with these kind of models, it's easier for them to catch up, right? Because they can access to the lessons, they can watch the videos and access all the ma or other materials online and outside the classroom, right? So then they have this one-to-one uh, -one time with the teacher to answer the doubts and the questions they have. So basically students also become more responsible and uh, also far more uh, self-directed, definitely. Um, so thinking about if you, you are part of an institution, right, sometimes or m some of you are in charge of um, you know, guiding other teachers, or you are like head of the department. But if we think as, as, as an institution, uh, in the case that a, the institution wants to make this approach part of this mission statement, for example, um, we would have to think of uh, instructional design. But is instructional design design like in very general terms, right? Because instructional design has to do with all the specifications and with the, and with the theory that is going to ensure the quality of instruction. That, that's why it is called the instructional design, right? So it is a, a process in which um, you analyze the learning needs, the learning goals, and you come up with the system that is going to meet 
you know, uh, those goals and those needs. So uh, basically there are um, several, you know, accepted models, but the ADI model, the one that we have there at the beginning, is uh, the most popular one, or the, um, this generic process that is traditionally used, yes, traditionally used by all the instructional designers and also training developers. Um, that's why it is uh, the, the one that is most commonly used. And basically, ADI is the acronym for these five stages. We have the stage, those stages are an, the an, um, analyze stage, uh, then we have design, development, implementation, and of course, evaluation. And all these together uh, represent these guidelines, right? Or the, these guidelines that are very dynamic and also flexible. And these guidelines are basically for building effective training uh, tools, right? Or performance tools as well. So if we were designing, right, like the flipped classroom approach for our, for our students with for our classrooms or for our institutions, um, we will have to do something like this. First, we would have to analyze right the an instructional problem, like what is happening with our students because we're not or they're not able to fulfill with all their learning outcomes. So there is a problem. You you have to analyze that what is happening there in the uh, in the instruction. So what you do is that you establish goals, you identify students' prior knowledge and skills. So then you can move to the design stage in, we, in which we're going to design the structure of the flipped classroom with learning objectives, with assessment instruments, with the contents, with lesson plannings, and also with all the media selection, with all the materials that you're going to be using for a flipped classroom. Then we have the development stage, and in development stage is where you basically create and assemble. You put together all the content assets and um, you integrate technologies, right? So here is when you start like applying a filter of all those materials that you previously also selected uh, and you decide which are the ones that you are actually going to use with your, with your students. Is then in the implementation stage, what you do is you implement the flipped classroom model inside and outside the classroom, right? You have to prepare your students, you have to show them, right? Train them on, on how those tools work. And we as teachers, we have to make sure that all the resources are in place, that all the, all the uh, tools that we're going to use with them or that we're going to ask them to use and to work with are available and are um, working. And then in the last stage, in the evaluation uh, stage, uh, basically you have to evaluate not just students' performance, but you, you also have to evaluate if Flip Classroom is working or not. Uh, and you have to provide opportunities for feedback. You have to receive also feedback from students and from your colleagues and from the institution, right? You have to analyze if everything is working so you can continue on that path, okay? Um, and believe it or not, there are seven different types of flip classroom. Although I like to think of these seven types, not just as seven different types, but also like different goals of flip classroom. So here we're going to see it. We're going to see all these types. The first one has to do with the standard inverted classroom. Um, in which students are assigned the homework of like watching video lectures or reading materials that are going to be relevant for next day's class, okay? So that then in class, students can practice what they did outside the class and before the class. Mm -hmm. So that is like the, the traditional uh, flipped classroom model. Then number two, we have the discussion-oriented flipped classroom. In this one, teachers assign the lecture videos as well as any other materials or any other videos or audio books or readings related to the subject, like, um, I don't know, TED Talks, for example, or YouTube videos or other resources that you uh, use. So class time is devoted to discussion and exploration of the subject. Um, this model can be especially um, useful with subjects in which context is almost everything like history for example or even 
English, right? Discussion-oriented uh, model. The third one has to do with the demonstration-focused uh, flipped classroom. And this works um, better with those subjects that require students to remember and to repeat activities um, like from heart, from the heart, like chemistry, for example, or physics, uh, or math, math class, right? So it's really helpful in this case to have a video demonstration of what students have to do um, so they can be able to rewind it or pause it or uh, fast forward and rewatch it again, right? Um, so basically, this is uh, it, it's going to work even better with these kind of subjects, right? Right. The next one, number four, is the faux uh, flip classroom model, like the faux, like uh, an imitation or like the fake flip classroom model. Um, and actually, this model or or this goal of flip classroom is going to work perfectly with younger students um, because younger students may not be prepared yet to do things outside the classroom, right? Like to watch videos or to read something on their own. So what happens with this goal or this type of uh, flipped classroom approach is that actually uh, the flipped classroom happens in the classroom, right? Because the students watch, the lecture videos or the videos in class with the teacher. So that would give them the opportunity to review the materials at their own pace, but with the teacher there, able to move from student to student, offering individual support and etc. Mm -hmm. Number five is the group-based uh, flipped classroom model. And this one actually offers or adds a new element for students to learn, and that new element is actually the students. Um, the, here with this model, the class starts in the same way that the other class uh, do with the lecture videos and other resources before class, but the shift happens when students come to class and they get together to work in groups on that day's assignments, okay? So uh, what this format, uh, format does is that it encourages students to learn from one another and help students not only to learn what the right answers are, but also uh, how to explain to appear why those answers are right or not. That is the group-based flipped classroom model. Number six is the virtual flipped classroom model. And this is actually very popular and very common in with older students, like college or uh, universities, right? Because for older students in, in some courses, um, the flipped classroom model can, can eliminate the need for classroom, classroom time at all. Because um, uh, what college or university uh, teachers already do is that they actually and currently share lecture videos for students to watch, to view, and they assign and collect work via online learning management systems, right? So what students do actually is that they come to class um, or they attend, right, to class hours, uh, actually to have like this very brief one-to-one -one instruction with the teacher based on each one of those students' individual needs. So basically this is very, very uh, common in, uh, with young adults. Number seven, uh, we have flipping the teacher. Uh, and in this case, all the videos and all the materials that are going to be selected or created for a flipped classroom doesn't necessarily have to begin and end with the teacher, okay? Students can also make use of the videos to demonstrate proficiency also. So in this case, you can assign students to, you know, do these role play activities, but also to record these role play activities to show competency or to ask to film themselves presenting a new subject or working on a new skill, right? That um, is going to show like the way of teaching the teacher, okay? 
So these are the seven different types or seven different goals of using Flip Classroom. Now, I'm very sure that most of you, uh, and I will have to say that all of you are very familiar with this pyramid right here. Here we have, uh, you know, the very famous Bloom's taxonomy, but let's see if we can um, try to identify how to use or how to work with this pyramid in the flipped classroom, okay? Because I'm sure that most of us uh, have heard and we always try to make our students, you know, uh, apply and analyze and evaluate and create, right? The higher, you know, or the upper levels of this taxonomy, we all want to achieve that from our students. Uh, and we know that in theory, but sometimes, in practice, it gets, it gets a little bit complicated. And what happens is that, well, not always, but most of the time, um, we expect our students to complete some challenging tasks without our guidance and without our assistance. So basically, that is what sometimes the students do outside the class or what we unconsciously require uh, uh, students to do, right? So. Yes, why is it that we do these like easy assignments or the so-called easy assignments or activities or tasks that require from students just understand and remember in class and we ask them to do the hard stuff at home without help. So let's think, let's think for a minute of what could happen if students uh, don't finish their homework or if they don't understand the concepts at home or if they don't have someone there to help them to do these activities, right? Um, so most of the time, this is what happens, right? I'm not saying that it's always like that, that we're doing everything wrong. No, it's not like that. But most of the time, uh, this is what happens. So what we should try to do, try to accomplish with the flipped classroom model and using also this uh, taxonomy is that um, we should allow students to access their lower levels, you know, of Bloom's taxonomy, like understanding and remembering on their own time and provide them uh, with opportunities to practice knowledge in very challenging and engaging tasks, more demanding, you know, with their peers and with the teacher in class. Okay, so again, we would have to flip uh, this pyramid in order to use it um, properly. And as the essence, right, the essence of flip classroom has to do with technology, we also have Bloom's digital taxonomy that is all about using technology and all the digital tools that are going to facilitate students' learning. Um, this kind of student engagement is defined by these power verbs that can be used for almost every lesson planning. And also, if you want to do like curriculum mapping, you can also use it. Right, so you can use these verbs, which cover the span from uh, from the taxonomy that go from lower order thinking uh, skills to higher order thinking skills. Okay, so here we have these power verbs. I, I know that they are like they're very tiny verbs like that, like uh, there. I probably you can see them all. So I selected just a couple of each category, so you can have an idea of these um, digital verbs in Bloom's taxonomy. For example, for the first one we have for remembering, for, for the remembering uh, you know, stage, networking or Googling. Um, then we have verbs like tweeting or tagging. Then we have verbs like uh, computing or uploading, right, for the applying uh, level there. Then we have for analyzing verbs like advertising or surveying. For the evaluating um, a stage, we have verbs like commenting or posting. And finally, for creating, uh, we have a lot of interesting verbs there, but some of them are like blogging, for example, or pod podcasting, or video blogging could be also wiki building, filming, recording could also be some of the other. Uh, very interesting verbs that we could use to um, prepare, you know, uh, lessons thinking about using the use of technology. Okay, so we have 
talked about, or I have talked actually about um, general terms of the flipped classroom, but why, right? Why should we uh, uh, flip the classroom? Why should we uh, use this approach? And here I have some potential uh, benefits uh, of implementing the flipped classroom model. Basically because it provides uh, opportunities for reflection for both students and teachers. Um, it can be used to check the most important concepts. It can be used also for clarifying doubts, uh, questions or mistakes. Now, if we think of what is actually happened, happening sorry, right now that we are not sure if our students are going to be able to finish the school year, um, probably we would have to, we're going to start thinking about how to cover those most important contents or concepts before the school year finishes, right? So with Flip Classroom, we could actually be doing that, okay? We could actually be doing that. Um, another benefit could be that um, it, it could help students to review some content. It also fosters peer learning and social interaction. Um, it gives the students the opportunity to work collaboratively through the creation of pro projects. It teaches the students uh, the sense of becoming more responsible for their own learning process. And it has been proved in some studies that it increases um, students' commitment. Mm -hmm. Students uh, actually uh, are more committed with their own process also using the flipped classroom model because they have like more time to work at their own pace. Um, now that we have seen the benefits, now how to do it, how to uh, teach uh, effectively. These are some of the suggestions that I, can, uh, that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, first of all, if we want to use this approach and we, we want to use it uh, effectively, we have to communicate our students the reasons uh, for flipped classroom and explain them why we think that this methodology will make their learning process easier. We have to offer incentives so students can actually come prepare, you know, uh, to class. You have to establish clear connections between in-class and outside class activities. They have to be related, they have to make sense, okay, uh, for what they do, or students are doing outside the classroom and inside the classroom. Um, you have to make sure that all activities are well-defined and are well-structured and that they are aligned to the learning outcomes. You have to give students enough time to carry out their assignments and their, their tasks as well. You um, have to offer a, and facilitate also, you have to facilitate and guide the learning process. Teacher, the teacher has to be a facilitator. Uh, the idea is that you can monitor also your students' learning processes. And uh, uh, if you want to get better results, you have to use user-friendly technology, not just for students, but also for you, okay? For both teacher, teachers and students, user-friendly uh, technology. Um, and as it happens with uh, everything that is new, uh, with most of the process or with difficult process of change, uh, there are some challenges, of course. And some of the challenges that might come up if we think of using the flipped classroom approach could be that, that um, students may not be prepared depending on their age, the, their level of maturity, their background also, uh, their current reality. So um, students might not be uh, yet prepared. So we have to analyze. That why I, that's why I mentioned before like the ADI model because analyzing is a very, very important part of designing, you know, the flipped classroom instruction model. Selecting or producing all the materials that you want to use with your students require time and effort, okay? So you must have enough time, you know, and put a lot of effort in doing that, right? In selecting or producing the materials for your students. 
lessons require preparation and an appropriate combination of the elements that are going to be used inside and outside the classroom. You know what, it does not fit all the contents or subject areas, but in the case of English, it works perfectly. Or it could be a very useful way to approach or uh, teach uh, the subject using flip classroom model. Students may not understand uh, the importance of the process like immediately, so you have to give them time, right? They have to also process, uh, uh, you know, this new approach or this new way of working. So you cannot expect, you know, results uh, immediately. So give it time. If you want to go with it, if, if you want to go on that pad of the flipped classroom, uh, give them time, okay? And um, the equipment and access to videos or digital resources may be a problem, okay? The access to digital resources, that is also part of the analysis stage, like think of your students, think of um, the institution also. Uh, it's going to be harder if you don't have the, the, the technological resources in the school or outside the, the school, right? Outside the classroom, thinking in your, you know, your students' uh, reality. Um, if you're in the classroom and you want to work, for example, with the, uh, with the discussion model of the flipped classroom in which students are required to get in groups and work, if you don't have enough space, there might be some difficulties to work in teams or collaboratively. And uh, as I said before, flipped classroom requires a deep change um, in the role of both students and teachers, or if you think, you know, bigger in the institution. So uh, you have to uh, be willing to change, okay? Um, and before we move on, now it's time to go to our second poll, okay? So before we move on, you're going to see again, I'm going to share with you um, a second poll. And in this poll, let me just, okay. The question is, uh, which of the, you will see a list of platforms or management systems, okay? And you have to look at them, read them, and if you're using, uh, one of those uh, uh, platforms or, or systems, select the ones that you're using for remote teaching, okay? You can select more than one. Mm -hmm. So here we have them. Uh, Jime, can you just say yes or no, if you can see oh, it? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. So which of the following platforms or management systems are you currently using for remote teaching? So we have Google Classroom, Macmillan Education, the Richmond Learning Platform, uh, Myon, English Attack, My English Lab, the Cambridge uh, Learning Management System, Oxford uh, Tree, Highlights Library, or if you're using another. So um, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes or maybe just one minute uh, so you can finish voting. Mm -hmm. Wow, most of you are currently using Google Classroom. Yes, most of you then we have, wow, a Richmond Learning Platform. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I can see that you are already also using my English lab, uh, Cambridge Learning Manage Management System. Pauli, we're getting uh -huh. a couple of Moodles in the chat room, which was not an option. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Quite a few Moodles. Moodle, uh -huh. okay, fantastic. Maybe that fits into the other category, right? Exactly, the category. but I just wanted to let you know which other. Fantastic. Okay, good, good. Moodle. Moodle is another one. Yes, very popular, very famous also. Thank I you. I saw Zoom. I also see Edmodo as a platform. Uh -huh. Ah, okay, okay. Blackboard. Yeah, so there are Blackboard. quite a few others there. Fantastic, good. Uh -huh. Interesting. <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're going to stop this right now and I'm going to share with you the results so you can also um, take a look at the, the numbers there. 
So most of you are very familiar with Google Classrooms. Fantastic. And of course, you also have, if I scroll down here, we have um, a large number of you that are using, like we were just discussing, other type of, uh, types of uh, um, platforms or learning management systems to, for remote teaching. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Good. Let's continue then. Okay. Is it okay, Jime? Yes? We yes. All good. Okay. Uh -huh. Good. Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, now in this second part, the uh, actually, we're going to go to the uh, uh, if, think of the most simple way that you can work with this approach, right? And uh, that would have to do with um, videos, audiobooks, and interactive activities. Of course, you have, you have just said that you are using, you know, learning management, system, management systems or other platforms for, for remote teaching. But what you can actually do when you use those tools uh, is to select these kind of resources like videos and audiobooks and interactive activities that you can um, include also in whatever that you are working with. Um, so here we have some, some suggestions and some examples of uh, like many of the tools. We, we know that there are a number, a large number of tools and resources and websites where you can find, you know, these videos, these audiobooks that are going to support your teaching. Some of them are like, uh, for example, this one, number one is Khan Academy. Khan Academy provides personalized learning, trusted and cross-curricular content, and also a lot of tools to empower teachers, okay? Um, so that is one, Khan Academy. Another one, and which is a very interesting source of lectures and news, is videolectures.net, which is also supported by UNESCO. So that is also a very interesting source of information if you want to use um, video lectures or working with news. Mm -hmm. That, oh, this one uh, does not, you know, is not necessary to add more information to this one. I'm sure that is very famous and very popular, and most of you are uh, familiar with this TED Talks, right? And you, you can see that you have a lot of topics there that go from technology, design, activism, community identity, uh, per, uh, personal growth, social uh, change, health, and et cetera, et cetera, TED Talks. Again, does not you know require any further explanation. YouTube videos. I'm I'm sure that all of us have used at least once <laughs> YouTube videos for our lessons. And our very own, you know, Richmond's very own English attack. You you mentioned it. Uh, there were a lot of uh, you there who answered uh, that are currently using English attack. We know that English attack. Um, was designed by experts, you know, um, in like gaming experts, but working with teachers. So they came up with this uh, platform that um, has, a, has, sorry, an effective approach to learning English because all the lessons combine movies, video clips, language games, you know, so uh, basically it helps students to be immersed in this learning experience, uh, also to maintain their motivation. Very, very interesting. You know that you can, the ones that are familiar with English Attack, you know that you can uh, access all those exercises that you see at the bottom there um, to work with one video booster, with one video. Uh, so students go from, um, you know, uh, first exposure to vocabulary and they move to comprehension, to advanced comprehension, practicing grammar, etc. So student, all those students can work at their own pace and uh, in, the, in their own time at home. Teachers can still monitor and track students' progress with English Attack because they, teachers can also assign different video booster or photo vocabularies. Uh, you can also browse, right? You can apply a filter and, and select the videos that you really want your students to watch or work with. Mm -hmm. The same happens with the visual dictionaries. You can browse and you can select the specific topics you want to cover. You want to come, or maybe you want to complement your teaching with this, right? Because video, uh, or sorry, the, the visual um, dictionaries 
are as, uh, some kind of like flashcards, but online. Uh, in the school area, you, you, you know, you have, you know, the possibility to uh, create your classes, to identify your students and put them in different classes, to assign the activities, also to assign the tests, right? The tests here, of course, are in the format of video boosters because you want to check what uh, your students' English proficiency levels are. Mm -hmm. That is what basically you uh, can do with English Attack. The other one is Mayan, and I'm sure that most of you uh, or the ones who are working, currently working with Mayan are very familiar with it. Uh, and we know that we have like two types of working with Mayan, with the Mayan Reader, uh, which is this platform, actually this like literacy environment, right, that gives students access to more than 6,000 digital books, uh, which are matched to students' interests, their grades, their lexi level, and actually students can interact also with the books because they can intervene them with the reading tools, right, they can listen also at the same time they are reading. But most importantly, one of my own like uh, most uh, romantic goals is to foster and promote and promote reading for pleasure okay which is reading is one of the most important skills so there you have my own you see uh there I, I i highlighted you know that students can listen and read at the same time they can work with the tools that you can see on the right side of your screen you have the dictionary right um Teachers also have an, uh, uh, like a classroom area in which they can manage the students, they can assign the groups, the classes, they can create projects. And of course, you can download a number of reports that are going to help you also with your work and with your job as a teacher because it has full traceability, right? Uh, and the other option of working with Mayan has to do with Mayan News. Uh, Mayan News provide digital news and articles for students that can go from uh, timely topics to current events uh, which incorporate uh, multimedia, right, like videos, slideshows, pictures, etc. And the topics cover different categories also that can go from space, science, fashion, arts, etc. And um, teachers, students can access each day's edition right uh this one's from last week right which was earth day last week um every day you can access five different articles all the articles or especially these ones the five uh, uh, articles that are uploaded each day come up come with this teacher guide so you have like there all the notes for you as a teacher with the recommended grade levels the word count also um with all the answers for the quizzes that come at the end, uh, also different templates. So it is also very interesting what you can do with uh, with Mayo News. Also, the same that the, the same that happens with the books. With Mayo News, you have the the opportunity to listen at the same time that you are reading the article. In this case, and teachers can also create projects projects using the uh, Mayan news. Mm -hmm. And there you have at the end, like these three questions, uh, quizzes that you have at the end that actually measure like general comprehension of the article. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not least, we have our very own virtual learning environment, which is uh, the Richmond Learning Platform uh, that shares uh, some of the characteristics or features of a, um, an LMS, but it's not a management system per se, okay? So also, again, the ones uh, who are very familiar with the uh, Richmond Learning Platform, uh, I'm sure that you know that here you have access to all the class materials that are going to complement your lessons and your courses, and you find all the additional resources to use online, but also some, you have some resources you can download you can assign regular uh, interactive activities to consolidate the contents also, um, not just as activities or interactive activities, teachers can also assign, you know, the assessments. Uh, so if we think of, you know, our current situation in which we cannot assess our students, uh, this could be an option to do it, 
right? If you're working with the Richmond Learning Platform, you can still assess your students and monitor their progress and see how they are doing. Uh, the MARC book allows teachers to access, again, the same as my own, you have full uh, traceability uh, of your student's progress. And in that sense, it helps you because it provides a way to identify, you know, a strong or weak points. And you can make um, maybe ongoing changes or maybe think of future changes of your teaching practices or teaching strategies. Uh, the forum is a way for teachers to interact with students and basically you can make them hear, uh, you can ask your students to put their thoughts and their reflections and their ideas here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the up upload section provides actually one of the perfect tools to share content with the students. So if you thinking about using flip classroom methodology, um, this could be a, a good way of doing it, right? This could be a way of interact with your students to share the contents uh, that you want, that you're going to assign them to review and to read and, or maybe to watch or to listen before the class. Mm -hmm. So that could be a way of using it, working with uh, flip classroom through the upload section. Um, but finally, if you need a, a reliable, you know, source of information in terms of all the learning solutions or softwares or different websites and any other, you know, things available online that are going to help your remote teaching, you can visit uh, this website. That's why I put the link there. If you want, you can uh, take a picture uh, or maybe a screenshot of this if you prefer, so you can have access to the link there. Uh, and you can visit, you know, it's uh, supported by UNESCO, so it's reliable. Uh, and actually they decided to put a list, they come up with this list of distance learning solutions, especially now in, in the times of, you know, the pandemic that, that we are undergoing. So like, for example, they provided that list of some digital learning management systems, right like the ones that you mentioned you were mentioning google classroom is there moodle is there you see um but also they um uh, there they have a list of systems built for use on basic mobile phones for example uh also self-directed learning content you know the ones that students can access uh at their own you know on their own time um to work in an autonomous way and these last three uh, that are very interesting also, like collaboration platforms that support live video communication, in our case, you know, live video, you know, teaching, like, there we have Zoom, Skype, Teams, Hangout Meet, etc. Um, then the, the next one is tools for teachers to create digital learning content. And finally, there you have an external repository of distant learning solutions. Uh -huh. So visit it. If you want to get more information uh, from a reliable source, visit the, uh, the website provided by UNESCO and you can definitely find more information there. And well, dear teachers uh, all over the world, uh, this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, this um, um, word cloud that I designed basically summarizes uh, some of the main concepts that I wanted to include here in this webinar. Um, so there we have like uh, videos, innovation, technology, instruction, tasks, uh, commitment, responsibility, projects, and so on, and so on, and so on, okay? So uh, I think we are just in time, like one, one hour, exactly. I, I was very, very precise. Hime, um, back to you. Maybe if teachers have comments, you know, or, or they want to make a suggestion or just sharing what they, what they think about it, if they liked it, if they're not, uh, back to you. You're getting lots of thank yous, <clears throat> lots of thanks so much, lots of blessings lots of thank yous uh, i think Juli has been helping me address some of the questions that came out through your session so it's basically lots of thank mm -hmm. yous lots of great ideas uh, lots of excellence and uh -huh. 
so that's basically what we have again Pauli I want to thank you for having repeated oh, this good. session we had a full room again yes so, I saw it I saw it so 300 teachers that was yeah. fantastic yes Twice. <laughs> so thank you thank you very much for 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 accepting our invitation to repeat the session thank you to all the teachers that mm -hmm. joined us today yes. just to let you know for access to the recordings you. you have to please contact your mm -hmm. local representative the, your richmond representative in Thanks your in country the they yes. will tell you how you can access uh, the recordings to all our webinars so lots of thank yous paulis <gasps> again Yes, I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading some of the the messages. Thank you so much. I'm reading that they really liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for repeating the web. So helpful. Thank you for participating. Wow. Thank you. Oh, I love it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining and for participating and for all those beautiful comments that I'm reading. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Pauli, once again, thank you, mm -hmm. Juli, thank you, and teachers, thank, thank you, you, and we'll see each other next time. Have a nice rest of the afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.